Good evening, everybody, and welcome to <clears throat> excuse me, welcome to St. John's uh, Bible Study Group. I'm the Reverend Richard Nordgren, associate member of St. John's, and I'll be leading this class. We're glad you're here, and it is our sincere hope that this will be a rewarding growth experience in your faith journey. <clears throat> Holy Scripture, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Holy Scripture is a fundamental document for Christians. God has chosen to make self-revelations, which were recorded and which come down to us over the centuries. Because the Bible is so fundamental, we at St. John's believe that an in-depth knowledge and understanding of what God has chosen to make known to us is of great importance. The uh, class We'll meet every Sunday at 8 p.m. There'll be some exceptions. You know, we had um, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, last weekend, we didn't have class. But normally, we're here every Sunday evening at 8 o'clock. Each class will last approximately one hour. Questions and discussion are welcome. Respect for the opinions of others will help foster a climate of openness and inquiry. From time to time, you may be asked to read a passage of scripture, either silently or aloud for all to hear. So please have a Bible at hand. Finally, loving kindness is both a revealed characteristic of God and a quality scripture encourages us to develop. Loving kindness is shown in a variety of ways, including making offerings and donations. If you feel moved to donate to St. John's, your gift will be gratefully received and used for the ministry of the church. Of course, there are other ministries and other good causes you may be feel, to, you feel drawn to help as well. By all means, do so. The point is to develop an attitude of loving kindness for others. So with that, let's begin. Over the last few weeks, we started looking at the life of Jesus and his teachings about the kingdom of God. A number of things have been really very forward. One is that you know, from the time of his baptism, Jesus was a man on a mission. Now we know very little about you know, his early years and his life as a young adult. We catch up to him when he is baptized. It is very clear from that point on that he is a person who has a mission, a calling. While he was alone in the wilderness, thought about how that mission might be accomplished and how his purposes you know, were going to be made known to announce the kingdom of God being at hand. Not even Satan could get him to publicly say, however, that he was the herald of that good news that he was charged to proclaim. Now, if only to satisfy the curiosity of his interlocutors, he might have briefly said something about who he was. But he did no such thing. His silence has been very perplexing. And as a result of it, you know, gallons of ink have been used to write reasonable explanations about this Galilean. Why was he so reticent to declare his identity and his authority? You know, he remember he took a crude survey and asked his closest associates what people were saying about him. And the answer came back, you know, some said that he was a, a prophet in the tradition of Isaiah. Others found he was the uh, uh, Elijah, prophet Elijah, you know, who was uh, thought to be a necessary precondition, you know, for the return or the, for the appearance of the Messiah. And uh, others, particularly those who were drawn from his inner circle, a few in number, you know, were prepared to, to say, as Peter did, that he was the Messiah, the Christ, you know, the son of the living God and Lord. Jesus did really nothing to 
uh, confirm or deny those affirmations. And on those rare occasions when he did reveal his identity publicly, um, it was to a very limited audience, such as to the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, to whom he announced that he was indeed the Messiah. But he did it sotto voce, yeah, so only she could hear. I think that she was the first evangelist, you know, certainly the first evangelist of the, of, of, who was a female. You know. But they, given that, you know, uh, we have to wonder why he was so silent about his uh, title and authority. Um, perhaps it all boils down to what he told his mother when they were at the wedding in Cana very early after he had returned from being baptized. You know. They're at a wedding and the uh, wedding party is running out of wine. And his mother brought that to his attention and, and he you know, somewhat you know, snidely, but also quite accurately said, eh, what does that to mean to us? It's not our problem. Somebody else is supposed to be taking care of the refreshments. Well, she did not take his rebuke you know, seriously and uh, went ahead and instructed the, uh, the, the party staff to do what he, uh, he, uh, he had told them to do. So he told them to fill up some jugs with water and then to taste it, and lo and behold, it was wine. And uh, this was, as John said in his gospel, uh, his first of many signs and miracles. And what Jesus had to say you know, about his reticence to, you know, to do that, he, was, he said it was not yet time you know, to make his glory known even to his disciples. But the nudging of his mother you know, got him to, uh, you know, to make a uh, uh, revelation of his authority and his powers. Signs, wonders, miracles, you know, were among the ways Jesus announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. But there are other ways as well. You know? And tonight we'll be looking at uh, um, how Jesus used parables you know, to give instructions you know, to his followers and to the audience which uh, he attracted. I think it's important to remember that Jesus was an itinerant, you know, going from town to town in Galilee and occasionally into Judea and the outlying provinces and principalities. Uh, and whoever he came across, you know, he either said or showed them what the kingdom of God was like. You know? um, but he was he was a ded he was dedicated to to being a wandering, traveling you know, preacher. As he said on one occasion that he was so poor, he couldn't even afford to have a place of his own where he could go at night to sleep. Yeah. But his, uh, his long walks uh, with his uh, disciples and other followers were opportunities for him to, uh, to instruct them how they too could become heralds of the good news. And one of his preferred methods you know, of uh, teaching was through the use of parables. There are over 30 parables in the four gospels. You know? And we probably heard a whole lot of them, you know, parable of a good Samaritan. Yeah, that's um, a very, very popular one. I don't think we take enough time to uh, ask ourselves the question, what exactly is a parable? Oh, well, we use the word all the time, but do we know what it means? You know? And in its meaning, you know, there's uh, a lot of power. And the rules and practices of rhetoric, which is that form of speech where people strive to convince or influence others, you know, to change their mind and to see things as the announcer is seeing them. Uh, parables are defined as short stories drawn from ordinary experiences, which most people uh, would be familiar with. And to use that ordinary experience to make a comparison or a connection between what people knew and what was not known to them. In other words, parables cleverly make a comparison by starting with a well known subject, such as farming practices, the weather, uh, politics, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, sort of surreptitiously nudges into seeing how those common 
elements of human life, you know, are related to something we may not have thought about or a principle that had not been, you know, we had not been cognizant of or a way of life, you know, um, a moral teaching that we had not paid much attention to. Many parables you know, that Jesus used begin with this phrase, you know, the kingdom of God is light. Matthew you know, preferred to use a different description, calling it the kingdom of heaven. But they are, they are the same things, even though you know, they have different titles. So when Jesus begins to, to teach and says, you know, the kingdom of God is light, you know, you should expect that there's going to be some comparison which follows, you know, a comparison which is between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Parables are an independent and self-standing form of rhetorical expression and teaching. You know? um, as I said, they're, you know, they're used to influence you know, the thinking of those who hear them. Um, they are independent in the sense that they can stand alone. Uh, they don't need a fuller context to make them uh, understandable. And they're independent also is that you know, they're not some form of other rhetorical devices such as allegories and analogies and similes. Um, they, uh, worst of all, that you know, I think anybody can do to a good parable is to turn it into an allegory. You know? And uh, I, I've you know, regretted hearing many good parables you know, turned into allegories uh, and their power and punch has been lost. Now the, the exact number of parables you know, in the four gospels has not really been you know, you know, decided once and for all. You know? It's because some of the so-called parables you know, uh, are actually aphorisms or some other figure of speech. They lack the details which create a story from which fresh insight can be drawn. You know? The parable of the mustard seed in Mark, Luke, and um, Matthew is an example of a questionable parable. It's short, as are most parables, you know? um, but it relies very heavily, perhaps too heavily, on assumptions that people know something about mustard. A so-called parable that is even more terse, you know, is the, the parable of the yeast or sometimes called leaven. It begins with the announcement that the kingdom of God is like, well, that's all well and good. And that is followed by a brief statement, you know, that a woman mixed flour and yeast together. Well, so what, you know? Um, you know, people have to know what goes into bread making uh, to have any clue about what this parable means. I have to say and though, Richard, more I have yes. to say though, Richard, during COVID, when we all started making bread at home, you may <laughs> you may no, you may recall that in New York yeah. you could not find yeast. Um, yeah, I remember that. People were shipping, we got yeast from Iowa. We had somebody send us some yeast from Iowa when we were mm. trying to make bread. So people may have a better understanding of this parable now since COVID than before. So just wanted to point well, that out. Thank you, yeah. Uh, yeah, I do remember that now that you mentioned it. Yeah. But if, you know, if people don't have any idea of what yeast does, you know, then the, uh, the meaning of the parable is going to remain opaque. But even more critical, you know, for the understanding of this parable is to recognize, you know, the, the status of yeast in Jewish teachings and, and beliefs and practices. You, know? uh, you need to know the difference between sacred bread and how that's different from ordinary bread. Lacking that understanding, you know, it's um, a so-called parable with a big, so what, you know, what are you trying to tell me? In fact, you know, many did not grasp, you know, what Jesus was trying to draw their attention to when he used parables, you know, to describe the kingdom of God. You know, when he said there, you know, it's like a mustard seed or a yeast, you know, 
even some of his disciples, you know, didn't get what the point he was trying to make, and they asked him, you know, um, you know, about that. And that's recorded in Luke 10, you know, which I will read from the ninth and tenth verses. Jesus told them, you know, to you I have given the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Um, I think Jesus is saying to his followers, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. You know? Um, you know, if the Holy Spirit is allowed to work in your, in your thinking, then parables are going to make brilliant sense. Otherwise, so what? You know? There are several occasions, you know, when the, uh, the meaning of the parable as, as Jesus taught, you know, um, was not recalled or, you know, was not understood. There's two in particular that uh, fit into that category. Uh, the parable of the sower um, and the parable of the uh, wheat and weeds, you know, sometimes it's called wheat and tares. You know. Here's the sort of a neat little word, you know, um, sort of fallen into his favor in our society. Um, you know, even if we allow that some of the, the so-called parables are actually sayings or affirmations, aphorisms, there are still a large number um, and um, you would think that the gospel writers would have had full access to the full volume of material that Jesus you know, taught using parables. But strangely, even if they did have that collection, you know, not all the um, uh, four gospel writers use the, the same parables. You know, we, uh, we can imagine that uh, Mark had access to at least one collection of parables. Uh, and since Luke and Matthew had Mark's gospel to, to uh, use as an outline for the ones that they were constructing, you, know, you would think that there would be uh, many of the same parables found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, actually, there are 33 parables generously defined as such that are used in only one of the four gospels. You know? um, if they had access to a... Uh, a large body uh, of parables, most of the time they chose not to use all of them. <clears throat> there are two parables found in both Matthew and Luke, but nowhere else. There are 13 parables found in all three synoptic gospels. None of the parables that are found in the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are used in John's gospel. John did not particularly favor you know, reporting the teaching method of Jesus, you know, in use of the parables. So there's only three of them uh, that are in John's gospel. <clears throat> it is conceivable, you know, that the distribution um, that I uh, just identified, you know, may have been the result of, you know, the inability of the, the growing, you know, Jesus movement to uh, have free and efficient communication between various groups. It was no easy thing, you know, to have a group of Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, in uh, communication with Christians in Jerusalem, or farther up north in Antioch, or into those places, you know, where Paul uh, uh, took his ministry. So that, you know, it's, uh, it's understandable, I think, that, you know, People would have just limited access um, to material that uh, was flowing around about, about Jesus and the kingdom of God. Well, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at some of the parables, but not all of them. Um, I'd like to, to pick a few which I think are, you know, uh, really interesting and, you know, point in novel ways, you know. Uh, or which may be difficult to interpret. You know? And uh, the, the first parable that we're going to look at tonight is the parable of the mustard seed. You know? And uh, it's found in Mark in the fourth chapter, Matthew in 13, and Luke also in 13. You know? So I have it here in, in Luke's version. You know? And uh, let me just read it to you. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? 
and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in a garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Diane, what does that mean to you about the kingdom of God? You can unmute yourself, okay, and if you'd like to answer that question. I'm not prepared to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll bounce it over to to Pastor. What what is it? Uh, what is that parable saying to you about the uh, the kingdom of God? Um. Well, I know a little bit about mustard seeds and what they grow into, and that they're weeds, um, throwaway weeds, um, kind of pesty weeds, um, and it. To me, it means uh, in God's economy, nothing has, is valueless. Everything can be useful and that God shows up in unexpected places and provides abundance. Yes. Okay. So nothing is going to go to waste. Even the squeal of the pig gets used. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's that and there's a little bit more too, I think, which helps us uh, get a hold of this. Um, uh, the Mediterranean mustard plant is variously used as um, a seasoning in foods. Uh, it had medicinal purposes. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, it uh, you know, could not be used in many cases as an animal feed because there are some certain phytotoxins which are, are found in it. Okay? Um, so, you know, humans will use it as a, a, a seasoning and as a medicinal herb. Mm -hmm. But one other thing which is very characteristic about the, uh, the mustard is that it is very invasive. There were laws on the books and fines imposed upon people who let mustard, you know, go crazy and escape the confines of their garden. Because um, if it got in with the uh, other yeah, the parts of the field, uh, it would um, you know, crowd out the, the crops that you wanted to grow uh, and produce something that you couldn't feed to your animals and that you could only eat in limited amounts. You know? Otherwise, it would be very unpleasant uh, experience. They, they, on the east end of Long Island, where I served, they were always um, concerned about invasive, invasive species like mm -hmm. the mustard seed. Bamboo which is beautiful to look at, if it gets a foothold, it mm -hmm. just takes over. And there's a bunch of plants like that that people were always fussing and fighting about out there. Oh yeah, and with good reason. Okay. The uh, uh, most mustards are, are fairly small plants. And uh, the um, you know, the story in, in, um, originates in Mark. And in Mark's rendition, it's just a shrub. You know? um, Matthew and Luke you know, embellish it a bit. You know? um, yeah, it becomes uh, uh, a sort of a small tree. That, uh, so from a bush that might be as tall as any one of us to uh, a tree which be 10, 12, and even you know, more, uh, it, uh, it's starting to grow. And yeah, I think that embellishment is there, you know, so that we get the idea in the kingdom of God, there's adequate space, you know, uh, for all of us to find shelter. You know? Um, you know, it's just not the birds which are, are drawn on, under its branches. You know? um, it's, a, it's a place where, you know, the kingdom of God, where we can find shelter as well. Um, so yeah, you know, so Jesus is saying, I think with, you know, some humor in his telling of it, um, that the kingdom of God, you know, is, is a real pesky thing. It's very invasive. It gets right in your face and takes over. You know? Uh, and if you're not careful, you know, you're going to have your hands full. Um, you know, I, I, I personally, I believe the kingdom of God, you know, has, delightful quality about it that does make us 
you know, snap to and pay attention. Um, um, you know, like a, a, a dab of hot Chinese mustard on the tongue, you know, it really commands your full attention. You know? <laughs> um, another parable that uh, I enjoy and I thought we would use tonight to uh, uh, get our, our feet wet with the study of parables is the, uh, the story of the um, uh, farmer who had good seed planted and then uh, it uh, got contaminated by someone who wasn't looking out for what he was doing, or maybe he was. Okay, this is the, uh, let's see, it's in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24, and it's only found in Matthew's gospel. Let me read it for you. Okay. He put before them another parable, the kingdom of heaven. There's Matthew's version of the, of the descriptor word. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. And then they went away. But when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. Then the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, oh, an enemy had done this. Yeah. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no. Or in gathering the weeds, you may uproot the wheat along with them. So I let both of them grow together until the harvest. In the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds, for, weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burnt and gather the wheat into my barn. Okay. Diane, if you're uh, prepared to uh, put your arms around that parable, what do you, uh, what do you think it's all about? Nope, this is your turn again, Pastor. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, one of the things I love about scripture is that I, I don't think God shies away from the reality of evil. Um, yep. That, you know, evil grows up, harm grows up next to good. Um, and if you try to eradicate it, Humans have tried to eradicate evil um, before, and it has never gone well. Um, and because we're not always good at differentiating what is wheat and what is weed. Um, so I think God's wisdom here is that, you know, God can tell the difference. And when they both come to maturity, then we'll differentiate. But Humans aren't good always at telling the difference between wheat and weeds. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was uh, I was rather, you know, well, mildly astonished by that aspect of the uh, of the parable. Now, I came from southeastern Washington, which has some of the world's finest grain growing soil. Um, it's like the black earth of the Ukraine, you know. Uh, are the uh, the Deccan fields of India uh, and the Yellow River Basin in, in China. It is amazingly good soil for growing grain, particularly wheat. Now, little barley is grown. Occasionally you get some oats in there, but it's mainly wheat. Um, and they do have a problem with weeds. Um, the um, the, the big ones which uh, uh, plague farmers um, are bindweed, um, tumbleweed, and cheatgrass. But there's one other you know, that, uh, um, that they had to contend with uh, on rare occasions, and that was ryegrass. And bindweed, tumbleweeds, and uh, uh, cheatgrass 
you know, you, you have to, you know, manage them with the uh, um, cultivation practices that you use, you know, herbicides, um, plowing, things like that. You know. um, but ryegrass, you know, um, you can pluck that out. And there's many a high school student you know, who earned good pocket money during the summer by going out into wheat fields and plucking the rye. You know. They now do that with a device attached to their circle sprinklers that uh, swabs a little bit of Roundup on top of the ryegrass, and so the kids don't have the job that they once had. You know? um, but uh, you know, there there was uh, no real problem with uh, or concern given to the possibility that you know when you pull up the rye, you know, you would take some of the wheat with you. Um, and farmers are you know, always concerned about the availability of resources, particularly water when they're doing dry land farming. Um, and weeds are notorious for sucking up a lot of water, so they want to get rid of them. But let me go back into the story as, as uh, Jesus told it, you know, and Matthew reported it. Um, it's a story that's simple enough. Most people would you know, have no difficulty following the uh, outline of the story of a you know, fellow who owned a, uh, a plot of land and you know, had it sown with good seed, which means that his seed was not heavily contaminated with weeds. Um, some identif unidentified enemy, you know, um, in the middle of the night, unbeknownst to the property owner, came and infested the field uh, when the uh, the weed and the weeds germinated and grew together. The owner's slaves, which um, you, know, did, you know, make it very clear that he was a well-off farmer. You know, um, you know he, he didn't have day laborers. He had uh, full-time you know, staff that were enslaved to him. Well, they told him there was a problem and they recommended pulling the weeds, you know, but he said, no, let them grow. You know? um, and uh, uh, at harvest time, we'll deal with them separately, um, the wheat. You know? uh, and that's how the, uh, the parable ends. You know? um, and that's one of those parables where you know, people didn't really remember exactly what the purpose and meaning of this parable was all about. So in Matthew 14, um there's an appended interpretation um that uh, identifies who the um property owner was you know who his enemy was and what that purpose of infesting the wheat fields was all about you know? but i'm gonna leave that aside because that's an allegorical interpretation you know? uh and i like to make uh keep parables parables you know? Uh, in Matthew's gospel, you know, uh, Jesus had a number of things to say about enemies. Um, and in chapter 5, verse 45, he said, instructed his disciples, love your enemies. Uh, a little bit later in the 10th chapter, he uh, reminded them, um, look, you know, what, you're, what you're being sent on you know, is a controversial mission. Now, it's going to arouse you know, conflict and opposition, you know? even within your own household, you know, your own family you know, may you know, find you know, what you believe is good news you know, to them is just you know, nonsense. You know? So expect them to you know, behave as you would think an enemy would behave. Because the you know, opposition is inevitable and you have to learn how to deal with it. So I, I think that you know one of the things that you know we see in this this, this uh, parable was that Jesus was telling his uh, disciples that they ought to expect a reaction, and if they didn't get it, perhaps they were just being too bland and pussyfooting around the uh, you know the scandal of the the cross or the um, you know the uh, radicalness of the uh, kingdom announcement. Um, but it says, you know, if you don't get a reaction, you might want to think about your message. You know? I think he also was telling them, you know, don't jump to hasty conclusions. You know, you, uh, you know, 
as I say, you know, you're going to, to face some opposition, um, but your opponents, you know, uh, may not be true enemies. They're, you know, they don't understand or they're confused or um, for whatever reason. You know? uh, but if, you, if they don't welcome what you have to say immediately, uh, give them a little chance to, to get used to what you've announced. You know? um, so, yeah, they may not be a, um, uh, a problem for other. And, you know, if they can become, you know, if they're thought of as opponents, then that they're wrong. You, know? uh, you may be jumping to hasty conclusions because if you give them a little time to think about it, you know, then, um, uh, you know, they may come around to see what is good news. That's good news for them as well. You know? um, so I, uh, I think, you know, it's possible to look at you know, that teaching of Jesus and, and apply it to our own situations and uh, telling us to be careful about making things either or, moral either ors, you know, black or white, good or bad, right or wrong. You know? Um, you know, I don't think I know of anyone who's you know, so one way that they can't uh, behave uh, the other way, at least for a little while. I think there's there's one other reason why um, uh, Matthew used this parable um, and why it's unique to him. Matthew, of all the four gospel writers, was the one who was most obviously writing for a uh, Jewish or formerly Jewish um, audience or Christians who still thought of themselves as Jews. Um, that's probably a better way to put it. Yeah. Um, these are people you know, who had grown up, you know, lived and, and breathed the, uh, the practices and, and uh, traditions of Judaism. Um, they heard about Jesus you know, and were just enamored with what they heard. You know. um, but they were not willing to, to give up their Jewishness. You know. And for decades, if not centuries, you know, there were a lot of uh, people who uh, had come from Judaism, you know, who wanted to, to hang on very dearly to those traditions and customs and ways of thinking. You know? So, you know, Matthew had to pay serious attention to the, the predilections of his audience. Uh, and remind them, you know, that, um, look, you know, uh, Jesus taught that the, the good news is a universal message. You know, it's meant for everyone and for all. You know? um, and you know, no matter who they are, if they show up in our fellowship, you know, uh, we are you know, obligated by the, the duty of Christian love to accept and welcome them. I think he is also saying you know, that uh, there may be occasions you know, when their ignorance uh, or disregard for our laws and customs you know, will lead them to uh, um, break one of the commandments. And having broken a commandment, we can cast them out. So Matthew is saying, just be patient. Yeah. That very same point, you know, is something that he um, taught in, in one of his, the miracle stories that he repeated, and that's the. Uh, the story of the of the great catch of fish. Um, uh, that uh, in this story, uh, the uh, people went out in the boat and caught so many fish that it nearly broke the nets. You know? And the fishermen were overjoyed with the size of their catch. But in the hall, they brought in um, fish that were edible and had market value. And then there was trash fish. And uh, the, you know, no one wanted to eat them because they didn't taste very good. And so you couldn't sell them and you couldn't serve them. You know? And you know, the, in that story, you know, the uh, instructions were, well, you know, sort them out, keep the good and toss the bad back into the lake. You know? um, we, we can't use them. Um, again, that's a, a story which is found you know, solely in Matthew, in which I believe you know, he, uh, uh, is trying to to soften the uh, the, the message of the uh, of the church that um, you know it's open to to all and all are welcome into its fellowship. You know? 
And um, in Matthew's uh, addition to that uh, uh, practical point of, of faith is to say, you know, someday we may find just the right reason you know, to cast them back into the light. You know, just be patient. Just as the, the property owner of that wheat field you know, told his uh, uh, workers, you know, you too have to be patient. So a lot of the things that are said in these parables, you know, draw on life circumstances as it was in the, the first century when, when Jesus was you know, walking around the, um, the dirt paths and the highways of the uh, Roman Empire. You know. Um, you know, some of it's probably lost on us. Um, fishing for most people is a recreation rather than a livelihood. Um, you know, we, we don't know, you know, just how nasty um, mustard can get, you know, if we have too much of it on our tongue or it has escaped the confines of our garden and, you know, um, we're facing the consequences of, of that. You know. um, and uh, I think this is you know, a very powerful argument for uh, us to uh, remember that uh, our world is very different from the world of the, uh, the New Testament. You know? And it behooves us you know, to become increasingly familiar uh, with that uh, way of life, how people live then, uh, and not impose, you know, what we know as a way of life onto that situation in their setting. Uh, we, have to, we have to learn about them because uh, we can't tell them about us. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it for tonight in terms of you know, what I wanted to take a look at you know, some parables. Uh, we'll look at a few more um, in the next week, maybe two, if we haven't decided. Um, but before we uh, close off for the night, are there any thoughts or uh, uh, ideas that people like to share? Any questions that you'd like to ask? Preaching on the parables is always a challenge because how much time do you spend educating and pulling out all these pieces yeah. that try to help them make sense? But also the temptation, as you said, just, just the temptation is always to Christianize the Old Testament the temptation yeah. is to modernize the New Testament. Um, and we do that a lot when we jump into literal interpretations of scripture. That's a way that we modernize. The ancients did not take any of this literally. Um, the creation myths, those sorts of things. Um, they were smarter than that. We have become dumb, you know, in how, yeah. We, yeah. how we use scripture, how we manipulate scripture. And how we have turned it into this lifeless idol. You know, scripture is enough on its own. Um, and, um, you know, the parables, I struggle with the parables um, sometimes. I just do because they don't hit me the right way and it's hard to make sense of them. Um, and I, I, I think that may be true for a lot of people. Um, but mm -hmm. they're hard to understand sometimes. They just are. They are. No, get one. Yeah, things are nice and easy when he tells us to, to love our enemies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. super easy. <laughs> yeah, that's really easy. Yeah. yeah. Um, neither love nor enemies have changed in, in people's understanding all that much over the centuries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, the. Um, Healing stories are also beloved, you know, because everybody's got some problem that they'd like, you know, to have a miraculous intervention take care of. You know? Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I understand why the disciples get them off to the side and they're like, yo, what did you mean by that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't feel so yeah. bad. I'm like, oh, they didn't get it either. Okay. Oh. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the some of the parables are you know just you know really obvious like the Good Samaritan. I mean, you know, you have to have you know about three brain cells left if you don't get that one. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that said, let me close this off with prayer. And um, 
Um, so join me, please. Gracious God, we are once again, you know, feel the strong need to express our appreciation for the various and sundry ways that you have chosen to make yourself known. Yeah. Um, in our reflection upon creation, yeah. in the love that we have for one another, yeah. we find uh, pathways to understanding who you are uh, and how you have come to be part of our life. Your revelation comes to us um, in scripture too, in the stories, you know, the miracles, you know, the teachings, uh, the controversies and the words of wisdom. Uh, we gain further knowledge and insight into who you are uh, and how the relationship between us is supposed to be and how it unfolds. Uh, so Lord, we thank you for caring enough to um, not let us stay in the dark. We thank you for loving us enough that uh, you've given us the spirit that helps us understand and comprehend. Uh, and you have given us the example of Jesus you know, after which we model ourselves. And, um, all for you know, the sake of others and for your glory. So we give you thanks this night and ask you to bless those who need a special gift. You know, we do this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. Sleep well. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>